Thank you so much. Thank you for the lovely introduction. And um, it's, it's great to be here. I feel incredibly honored to have the privilege to open the keynote today on the second day of, of GIDS. And this is kind of an interesting talk. I'm, I'm trying to come at things from a slightly different direction, but it really stems from something that's been driving me, and I know when everybody I've had the opportunity to interact with so far this week, it drives them. Right? We all want to be better. That's why we're here. That's why we're here this week, learning from some of the greatest minds of our industry. And it's a trait that I see in some of the greatest software engineers, this pursuit of perfection that we just try to be better. Every day we be slightly better than yesterday. And I, I think even though our industry is so young and, and there are still things that, that we struggle with in terms of architecture and technology and everything else, it's that trait that's gonna make everything so much better. Now, you are a self-selecting group because just as many engineers who want to be better every single day, there are a lot of people who tend to coast. And you are the exception. So I applaud you, just to begin with, I applaud you for your dedication to your craft and everything you do. And we have the opportunity to spend the day in what I call the conference bubble. And it's kind of depressing when that bubble bursts and we go back into the real world. Because when you go to a conference, you have the opportunity to look at all these glorious new architectures, all these shiny new technologies, all this, this limitless possibility. And then we have to go back to the real world where we deal with budgets and schedules and legacy technology, and we're going to be continuously forced to build rocket ships on go-kart schedules, and it can be frustrating, and it can be soul-crushing if you're as dedicated to your craft as, as I can see that you really are. And I'll tell you a little bit about my background. I, this is my first computer at an Apple II growing up, and I wrote my first basic program somewhere in the 80s, and by all accounts, I have a pretty standard tech resume. Right? This is, that's what everybody's resume looks like, right? And just as a brief aside, if we didn't meet yesterday, because I know uh, it's a different audience pretty much every day, or, or primarily, it's largely a different audience, uh, this is actually my resume. This is what I send out. Uh, it all stemmed years ago. I applied for a job. They gave the job title Code Warrior. And I thought, okay, I'll give you a code warrior, right? And I, I put this resume together, and it had that finger, and mission history. I think on the other side, it had confirmed kills. And uh, I've just used it ever since. And it's interesting because it's a useful heuristic in the hiring process because I've got my own personality and things like that. I showed that resume to somebody once and they said, you know what, if I would have seen that resume on my desk, I would throw it away. And I said, great, because I knew where she worked and I did not want to work there. It was one of those you know, burn and churn shops. So it's a great heuristic on that side of the hiring process. And I'm a fan of heuristics in the, both sides of the hiring process. Whenever I've been in a hiring position, you know, you wake up one morning, you show up to work, you've already got a ton of things to do, more than you could possibly do in 12 hours. You walk in and there's a stack of resumes like this on your desk. What I do, I don't even look at them. I take half of them, I throw them straight in the trash because I don't want to hire anybody who's unlucky. And it works. <laughs> Heuristics. But, you know, I could talk about my background as a software engineer, but what's more relevant today, I believe, is my background as a professional magician. For the past 20 years, I've traveled the world working and performing as a professional magician. So this is going to be a little bit of an interesting keynote because I'm going to talk broadly about technology to technologists and there's no technology at all. In fact, I'm using magic as a metaphor and an allegory for all these topics I'm about to talk about. So why magic? Magic, at its core, is an engineering problem with impossible requirements. Not only that, we deal with the inexplicable every single day. How does that make any sense at all? Arthur C. Clarke said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. More broadly than that, though, I think you can define magic as any experience where cause and effect seem broken. I'm going to give you a quick example of that. Imagine, if you will, you have a bug ticket come across your desk. Something seems to make sense, but uh, whatever you do, there seems to be an unintended side effect. Not exactly what you want, but I think we've seen this before. We can break this down. 
Basically, it's a, uh, yeah, basically it's a uh, tightly coupled front end. And I think we could probably see that there if we, nothing new. We've seen that before. All it takes is a little bit of refactoring. So let's, uh, there we go. Decouple the front end. Problem solved. Yeah? Except we still have that uh, weird unintended side effect. Oh, thank you. You know, they say insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, except we're expecting a different result. Most of us call that debugging. We'll try it again. Separate, we'll decouple our front end, if you will. And yet. <laughs> and you know, the funny thing is, I can see this, I'm, I'm, I'm performing for a group of engineers. You solve problems for a living. And I can see you're thinking about this already. Engineers tend to be a little more skeptical, a little more cynical. You can't just sit back and enjoy the magic. You're already thinking, I can see it. <laughs> Maybe the problem is not a tightly coupled front end. A tightly, yes, thank you. A tightly coupled back end. Anybody thinking that right now, I would like to invite you to uh, mind your own business. Let's do some uh, pair debugging. Uh, you're right on the corner. Do you mind coming over here real quick? Help me out with this. Take my scissors. And if you would, just uh, decouple the back end. Thank you. Just have those scissors down. That's fine. Thank you. Give her a round of applause. We fixed it. Let's ship it. We can test it in production. Oh, you know, let's separate these in time and space. So we go here and here, because they were touching. Oh, there it goes. It's a little longer. Ah, there we go. Perfect. Now this is getting even weirder and weirder. You know what? Let me, let me enlist the help of an assistant. Do you mind uh, fixing that? Just gently pull on that tassel. You broke it. <laughs> well, it worked in dev. I'll just say that. You know, I think it's situations like this where uh, you get into these weird situations. It helps to come up with a creative solution. That's why I always keep one of these. There we go. Thank you very much. Cause and effect, broken. Every bug I've ever tried to fix. Magic ultimately is an engineering problem with impossible requirements. And I, I talk about this, I get asked a lot, but how do you come up with new magic tricks? It's a pretty simple process. Basically, I think of the most impossible thing I can imagine, figure out a way to perform it, figure out a way to make it possible, and perform it. More succinctly, it looks something like this. And I bring this up right now because to anybody in this room, does this sound remotely familiar? Every single sprint, we get ridiculously impossible requirements from the product owner, then we as a team have to figure out how to make it possible, and we have to ship it. And what's really interesting, I talk about magic, but I actually unconsciously applied things that I learned creating magic tricks to my day job as a software engineer. But one of the things I learned, and maybe the most important lesson I learned, is that compromise is inevitable. We're going to have to compromise in every single thing that we do. Magic is the same way. Magic has its own inbuilt compromise because ultimately magic is not real. It's, it's, it's not something that I have available to me. I just have to get as close to this ideal as I can. Every project is the same way. We don't, we have all these constraints and we, we can't do everything that we want to, so we have to compromise. And the key is, and the lesson I've learned, is to make the right compromises. I think anybody who spent any time writing software has probably drawn something that looks something like this. The engineering triangle. Fixed schedule, fixed features, and quality, pick any two. And it's funny. Like, we think people get this. Our project managers are like, okay, we understand, we understand. We're gonna pick these two. 
Except if what you give them is not 100% perfect quality, they're going to be all over you. They're going to be angry at you. It's, it's, you know, we're being set up to fail. But the th truth is, in any project, the thing we have to realize is that you're not the only one who has to compromise. Ultimately, we can't deliver on our commitments unless somebody else delivers on theirs. And we need to get them to make that commitment up front. I, I learned this particular exercise from a book, The Agile Samurai, by John Rasmussen. And one of the exercises in this uh, Agile Inception deck that he talks about is setting these trade-off sliders. And these are brilliant, these are great, because it forces people to make the difficult decisions up front. You have scope, you have budget, you have time, you've got quality. And the sliders can only occupy one space. So you can't have two as top priority, you can't have three as top priority. I was on a project once that was way behind schedule, and it was so bad, we got pulled into a meeting where we just got yelled at for 45 minutes. And I don't know if you've ever been in some of those meetings. It's not fun. And at the end, the product owner says, well, what do you want to do from here? And I said, well, I assume we need to finish this and deliver this, right? And he says, oh, you bet. And I said, all right. And I wrote down on the whiteboard a list of every feature that was outstanding. And I said, let me ask you this. Which of those is top priority? You know what his answer was? Exactly. He says they're all top priority. Every single item on that list is top priority. Okay. So I turned to my team and I said, I guess we can work on whatever we want because everything on that list is low priority. <laughs> uh, you know what? I like that. I like that response. Do you know? Because it wasn't the response I got in the meeting. In the meeting, it was more yelling. And I said, look, you know, you got to understand, priority is a relative ranking of importance. If everything is top priority, if everything is high priority, everything is low priority. It's a relative ranking of importance. No two things can be top priority. And I said, imagine that uh, you found a lamp and you cleaned it and the genie popped out and you got one wish. What would your wish be? That's exactly what he said. You've worked for this guy too. He says, I want 25 wishes. And I said, uh, spoken like a true project manager, no, you get one. And he finally, after several minutes of deliberation, gave me one requirement. I said, great. Now you get two wishes. And he says, I understand. I'm like, well, five minutes ago you didn't. And we got two and three and four. We've got to make these tough decisions, and the earlier on, the better. Because you can only deliver on your commitments as a software engineer when they deliver on theirs. And we've got to hold the business, their feet to the fire. Because they're going to try every step of the way to shirk their responsibilities, but still hold you accountable at the end of the sprint. Now the secret is, and the key is, to make the right compromises. And I've got a little illustration for this. I've been trying something for several years, this dream of mine to be able to read minds for real, not an illusion, to predict the unpredictable. And I want to try this right now. Now, the problem is I'm dealing with a room full of cynical skeptics. It's OK. It's OK. I understand. So we're going to try to pick somebody at random. I've taken a piece of paper, folded it up. I promise you when I turn around and throw this over my shoulder, it's not going to go very far. Good catch. Thank you. But uh, this is why I want to seed the entropy pool. So throw it over your shoulder. We're going to throw it uh, three or four times. Let's do four. Right? That's a good, that's a good uh, seed, right? So throw that again. Oh, good catch. Throw it again. That's one, two, three. Oh, good. Four. All right, sir, you're right in the middle. I'm sorry. Come on down. Give him a round of applause. I want to start simple with this prediction. I want you to think of a number. You know what? I need to clarify. Asking an engineer to think of a number. <laughs> Int 32 max value. <laughs> Pi. E. No. So while you're walking up, think carefully. Let's make it an integer. Come on up. Come on up the stairs. Make it an integer. Positive. Okay, let's put, uh, let's put an upper bounds on this, because otherwise we could be here all day. I don't want you to pick like a simple little number, but I don't want you to pick something bigger than 100. Maybe somewhere in the middle there. 
Don't say it out loud. You've got one in mind? Okay. Uh, you know, let's do this because uh, I, I want one more person to check this. Make sure you're not going to you know, punk me. So let's do this. Take that pen. I'm going to turn my back. I'm not going to look. Uh, I think all the cameras are there, there, and uh, so nobody's going to see that. I'm going to look away. Your job is to make sure I don't peep. But write that down really big so people can see it at the end. Write your number down. Yeah. You got it? You got it? It's a good number. Two digit? It's three digit. No, oh, less than 100. <laughs> it's a good thing I gave him clear requirements. <laughs> All right, here, do me a favor. Tear that sheet out if you would. And uh, don't let me see it. Show it to somebody over there. And by the way, everybody who's wondering, no, it doesn't bleed through. I actually use a felt tip pen. I actually use a dry erase marker because if I use a ballpoint, that would leave a dent. And then I could just look at the dent underneath. And if I used a, like a marker marker, that would bleed through. But, I mean, there's nothing there. But it doesn't matter. Anyway, show it to somebody way over there. Is it, it's a whole number. It's an integer. It's, it's not three digits. It's less than 100. And it's a, it's a real number, rational number. Okay, fold that up. You've got to check these things. Know your audience. All right, now fold it up, fold it up. I'm going to try to guess your number. I'm going to try to predict the unpredictable. And uh, so would you be amazed right now if I just walked over to this whiteboard and wrote down a number and that was your number? Right? That would be amazing. Let me ask you this. Because there's so many possible numbers, would you be as impressed if uh, I wrote down a couple numbers, and it was one of those, right? Because, <laughs> you know, again, magic's not a real thing. I can't really read his mind, so I've got to find a compromise somewhere. So let's see. Let me ask you a question. Is it any of those? You know, I'll clear this up. So we can kind of get some lines of demarcation there. Is it any of those? Are you sure? Because there's a lot. <laughs> Here, let me see. You can sit down. It's, uh, sometimes the trick doesn't work. Was that it? 70? Yeah. 70. That's what I get for testing and production. <laughs> Actually, you know what? No, 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 no. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with this for a minute. Stick with it. Because I think we got something here. Maybe. Stay. I trained it myself. Yes, no, oh, okay. oh we, got, we got something here, okay? 70? 70? Look at this. 50 plus 7 plus 4 plus 9 is 70. How's that, all right? You are way too generous. I'm going to earn it for you. Let's do it again. 50 plus 1 is 51. Plus 12 is 63. Plus 7 more makes 70. Now hold it up. We're going to do it again. Okay. Wait, you were impressed with that, but no applause for that. <laughs> all right, all right. We'll keep going. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. I don't need your pity. We'll do it again. 11 plus 8 is 19, plus 2 is 21, plus 49 is 70. 5 plus 10 is 15, plus 3 is 18, plus 52 is 70. 4 plus 51 is 55, plus 6 is 61, plus 9 makes 70. No, 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 no. But wait, there's more. We can do the columns. 50 plus 11 is 61, plus 5 is 66, plus 4 is 70. 1 plus 8 is 9, plus 10 is 19, plus 51 is 70. 12 plus 49 is 61, plus 63, plus... Wait. Yeah, 70. 7 plus 2 is 9, plus 52 is 61, plus more makes 70. But wait, there's more. We can do the diagonal. 50 plus 8 is 58, plus 3 makes 61, plus 9 is 70. We can do the diagonals this way. 7 plus 49 is 56, plus 66, plus 4 is 70. Or we can do these four, these four, these four, these four. Or how about the middle? 8 plus 49 is 57, plus 10 is 67, plus 3 makes 70. Or we can do offset diagonals. However you add it up, they all add to 70. Thank you. 
All right. Put this away for now. Whew. I hope they put a bottle of water off to the side. I'm, I'm a little parched. It's a good thing the air conditioning is on. That's all I can say. Predicting the unpredictable. It's been a dream of mine. It's been something I've been working on for a long time, iterating, just trying to get better and better. The key thing is, one, know your audience, know your customers, know your users. I knew you were an engineer. I had to qualify a little bit. A rational number, a real number, a whole number. Otherwise, who knows what we, had, we would have gotten. And the key thing is, as well, when you're, make, when you're trying to decide what compromise to make, you have to ask yourself questions. Because if the only compromise I would have made to achieve that end, to deliver that feature or whatever for that creation was to write a bunch of guesses, you would not have been impressed. All right, nobody in this room, actually, you've been very generous, and I, and I, and I love you for it. You probably would have applauded like, ah, he's trying hard, good, bless his heart. But no, no, the thing is, you have to ask these questions. You've got to put yourself in the shoes of the audience or the customer or the users. You've got to ask the question when you're making a compromise. Does the user care? Is it going to make their experience better or worse? Because if we can actually put ourselves in the shoes of the customer or the business, and we can think about these compromises objecti objectively, we can compromise on the things that take away very little value and still deliver the things that have high value. And these are things we have to think of beyond functional requirements, beyond code coverage and code quality. Are we making the right compromises? Are we really delivering value? Things to think about. So know your customers. What is the app's purpose? What are the priorities? And we have to be objective. Because as engineers, it's so easy to get sucked into that rabbit hole of interesting but useless. Neil Ford, a speaker I'm, from ThoughtWorks that I'm privileged to speak with from time to time, is very fond of saying, meta work is more interesting than real work. So we have to be objective. And we're going to run into constraints. That's just a reality. Right? Time, resources, technology, budget, these are things that we're going to have to deal with. We're going to have to make compromises again and again and again. But this isn't a bad thing. You know, we realize sometimes illusions are enough. Sometimes we give the perception of improved speed instead of actually going through all the effort and reducing. Sometimes that's enough. Sometimes getting close enough is enough. And that takes a little bit of wisdom and it takes a little bit of perspective outside of our perspective as engineers. Because ultimately, engineering is not about perfect solutions. It's about doing the best with what you have. The other great thing about it that we're never grateful for, I find. I've never felt grateful for this in the moment. But constraints actually force us to be more creative. I remember once I toured a prison. And I mean, it was an old prison. It was, uh, it was, it was uh, you know, it was retired. Whatever, whatever you do with prisons, they go to the old prison home. But it was, it was a retired prison. It was empty. There are no prisoners in there. But the most amazing thing that I saw was all of the things that they created with the very few items that they had. You know, the way they used a tape player to build a tattoo uh, gun. The way they could make anything into a shiv. Really creative stuff. I mean, maybe it's not good creativity, but it's amazing what those constraints will do when you are forced to think creatively. Uh, you know, great engineers deal with cr cr constraints, rather, creatively. We don't throw up our hands and be like, oh, well, it's impossible. We're like, okay. Well, how can I make this possible? How can I do this anyway? A really great example of this was the, uh, the fast inverse square root in the Quake engine, if you've ever seen this. Uh, there was a technology constraint. They wanted real-time 3D graphics with light sources and, and realistic reflection and refraction of the light. And uh, consumer PCs just weren't powerful enough to do that in real time and have a reasonable number of frames. And it turns out there's an approximation that somebody just came up with in the middle of the night when building that engine. It wasn't a true inverse square root, but it was close enough. Sometimes all you need is that illusion. One of my greatest illusions, one of the things that I perform that more people talk about than anything else is actually born out of creativity. You know, I'll tell you this story very, very briefly. As a young, aspiring magician, 
My constraint more than anything else was capital. There's a joke. What's the difference between a professional magician and a pizza? A pizza can feed a family. And it's, it's funny because it's true. And I was trying to make a living as a professional magician and I wasn't doing very well. And I started to get creative, I'm like, okay, how, what are a couple ways that I can make a little bit more money? One of them, I found out, was I could do a little upsell. I could, I would buy bicycle playing cards. And uh, in the UK where I lived, those cost probably four or five pounds per deck. Now I could also go to the market and get cheap lousy playing cards for about 50 pence a deck. But I made that a feature because I could run those cheap playing cards through my inkjet printer, or let's be honest, my parents' inkjet printer. I can't afford that ink. And I would run it through and I would print their logo on there and I'd say, well look, uh, how about as a little extra, as a little memento, when every time I do a card trick, I'll give the card away as a souvenir and we'll put your logo on it. So it'll be like a real memento of the night. And it's only 10 pounds per additional deck of cards for the custom cards, minimum order five decks. And they think about that, well, that sounds great, you know, and they were already getting a great price because I was underselling myself. They said, that sounds great, let's do that. And so I would go get the cheap cards, I'd run them through my inkjet printer, and I would use them. You know, but, but bicycle cards have this lovely coating as the air cushion finish, which makes them uh, very fluid the way they handle. And the cheap cards don't have that, so you've got to treat them. And magicians, for you know, 100, 200 years who have been dealing with cards that didn't have these coatings would use something called fanning powder. Fanning powder is basically zinc stearate. It's a little white powder. Magician, magic shops buy this in bulk and they apportion out little baggies and for one pound fifty you can get a little baggie of fanning powder that's enough for a couple decks. And so I'd go get a few of those. I'd treat my cards. I'd have extra in case I need to re-up and I would bring that to the show. That would help me earn a little extra money. There was another trick I had. And it's just between me, you, and anybody who's watching on the video on the internet in the future. I feel okay talking about this because I think the statute of limitations has run out. Um, I would convince them to pay me in cash. Wink. And uh, the way I did this, it's amazing what you can get away with when you say it's part of a magic trick. You know, I go through security with all these weird things, and they're like, what is this? Oh, it's a magic trick. Oh. I'm part of the magic trick. Yes, let me get to my gate. Uh, and so I would say, I need you to pay me in cash. They're like, I don't think we can do that. I say, it's part of the trick. Oh, oh, well, I'll go to the bank. I'm part of the trick. And they get really excited. And that was the idea, they pay me in cash. And so this was the trick. Try to picture this. Uh, I don't know if this is a thing in India. In England, uh, there was a job for a really long time. It was the job of the tea lady. It was, it was somebody who was really retired and their job really was just to, to push around the cart of tea uh, in the afternoon for tea time. And because before we had electric kettles and the, the big machines, you could press a button and it would brew a cup of tea right there on the spot for you. They would push this big urn of tea around and, would, tea, would you like a biscuit? Two, oh, okay, you know you. And uh, lovely, lovely woman, every, it's like everybody's grandmother is what this person was like. And I would always pick this person to help me out. For the finale of the show, I would say, I'm going to do one more just to finish the night off. Could you bring up my fee in cash, please? And they would bring up my fee, and I would put it in an envelope, mix it with several other envelopes, and I would be blindfolded. And I would give all the envelopes to the lovely, sweet old woman, and I would say, it's all on you. No pressure. Hand me one of the envelopes you think it's not. And she hands it to me. And I'm blindfolded, and I'm like, I'm sure you're right. And I throw it in a bowl, and the bowl immediately catches on fire. And she's a little concerned, because this is my fee. And then she hands me another one. And we do this again and again. There's like five envelopes, until there's two left. And I have her facing me. So she's standing here, I'm standing here. I'm still wearing a blindfold. And I say to her, okay, take the envelope in your left hand, throw it in the fire, now, now! And she would okay, then throw it in the fire. And as, I'm, as, as soon as I hear her do this, I say, no, no, I'm sorry. Uh, that would be uh, my left, your right. <laughs> and she's standing here holding the envelope. The other one's flaming away. And, and I hear everybody chuckle just like that. And I, I rip off the blindfold. I'm like, wait a minute. What just happened? I look at her. What did you just do? <laughs> you better not have screwed this up. 
or else. And I tried to look menacing. I was like 19. I was still ruddy cheeked and, you know, and I, I spots. And, and she, she I'm like, you better not screw this up or else. And I reached my jacket and I would pull out a fake gun, like a starting pistol, a theatrical prop. And I would just hold it for a minute, look menacing. And then I would do this, I would say, because I really need that money. And everybody would say, they'd laugh, but it turns out not all laughs are good laughs. And uh, I'd say, no, it's okay, I'm sure you've got it. And I'd have them rip it open, and uh, sure enough, the money was in there. I'd take my applause, and then I would leave. Driving home one night, I got stopped by the police. I was driving and trying to read a map at the same time, somewhat erratically. I get pulled over. I didn't realize my briefcase was open. So try to picture this. Put yourself in the officer's shoes for a moment. Routine traffic stop, flashlight talking to the occupant of the car, and all of a sudden you see an open briefcase on the passenger seat with a pile of cash, little baggies of white powder, <laughs> and a gun. That did not go well. I was forcibly removed from the vehicle. That United video was nothing, by the way, compared to that. I was handcuffed. I was on the hood of the car. And I'm trying to explain this. I told you the magician thing gets you away with a lot. Here I am. No, oh, no, you don't understand. I'm a magician. It's a magic trick. <laughs> magician, huh? All right. Show me a trick. And there I was at 1.30 in the morning on the side of the road, standing in my headlights, doing a little show. But I did not get a ticket. And actually, an incredible trick came out of this. Thank you. An incredible trick came out of this because, uh, I, obviously, I don't do that anymore. I think that's an incredibly poor taste. But I still like to do something. I evolve that. I iterate as I do. And I'm just curious. Is there anybody in this room right now who has a, what's the largest denomination, a 2,000 rupee note? Or a $100 bill, a $50 bill, any of the above? Oh, Venkat, what do you have? Do you have 100? Oh, let's do that. Let's use uh, big money. <laughs> Come on down. Give them a round of applause. I would like you to be competent if you ever see it again. You know that's definitely your $100 bill. Would you mind signing it? I didn't realize you wanted this. <laughs> oh, I don't just want it. I have, I have designs. I'll roll my sleeves up. You've got to keep me honest here. All right. So we've got that there. And uh, somebody in the front who has a camera. Uh, oh, thank you for capping the pen. Somebody in the front who has a camera there. Show it to somebody up there. This gentleman here has got a camera on his phone. Have him take a picture so we've got the signature and... The, um, the, the, the serial number as well. That way, if we ever see it again, we will know that is definitely Venkat's $20 bill. 100. Oh, my mistake. I'm sorry. Really? Is it 100 Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, good. That's a super difficult pose to hold. All right, we've got the signed $100 bill. I'm going to do this super fairly. And you can still see the signature? Still see the signature? I'm going to fold this up. And uh, same concept, it's a, a slight difference. A few little minor differences. First of all, his money, not my money. A really important distinction. It's much more fun that way. Not only that, but... Uh, oh, would you be for stick out your tongue? Now, I'm going to number these, one through three, and we're going to see it play the same game. Actually, I'll mix them up a little bit. I'm sure you're paying attention, right? I'm convinced that Venkat has a photographic memory. How else can he do what he does, right? Okay, my pen's running out, but uh, you get the idea. One, two, and three. Fair? No sleeves, no nothing. Hand me one of the envelopes you think it's not. Just drop it right here in the cup. You can do anything you... you you're just, you're just going to... Cool. And another one you think it's not. Okay. I like it. He just goes with his gut. That's the no pile.
Wait. <laughs> Since it's the no pile. We'll just, uh, you know what I forgot? Do you want to change your mind? Yes. <laughs> it's not too late. And that's the beautiful thing. Like, we don't know if we're burning the paper. We don't know if we're burning the hundreds. Because all of these had stuff in them. And actually, before this gets too out of hand, uh, I can see the contents are more or less burnt. I don't want to set off a smoke alarm. It's the last time that we get invited to the, um, the, the science center. Thank you. <laughs> I've got the fire extinguishers back there too. But actually, again, I'm sure you're, I'm very confident. Open that up, show them the $100 bill with your signature and the matching serial number right there. Ladies and gentlemen, Venkat, Dr. Subramaniam, the man with the photographic memory. A round of applause for the... For... Seriously? <laughs> Here, let's see. Uh, I'll just, uh, I, can, uh, I, can, I can hook you up later, but uh, you know what? I, you know what? I, 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 it's consolation price. I got like a little something here. And my little box, box of mystery. I haven't touched it. Yes? No. Now I have. There's a couple things in here. First and foremost, there is a rather sharp looking knife. I can use it. We're gonna call that plan B. <laughs> and uh, I have, oh look at that, that's what I was looking for earlier. And we have a paper bag. Sealed, actually this has been glued shut, I super glued this shut. Um, you had that there for a moment, and what was that like the cycle grip? Uh, let's do it kind of pointing to the ground, let's, uh, knife safety 101. Okay, I'm gonna, we'll try this again. Uh, just one this time, this makes it a lot easier. You're gonna choose bag one through one. You're gonna choose one of them. So which one would you like? One. All right, this is super glued pretty well. Do you wanna just rip that? Uh... Yeah. Oh, that super glue kind of, oh no, no. Yeah, go ahead, open it up. And inside the bag here, we have An orange. You know what, I want to point this out. Just, you travel a lot. It is cold and flu season, you can't put a price on good health. Am I right, am I right? But not only that, let's do this. I'm gonna take this orange out. By the way, this has the uh, yellow and blue make green seal. Double sealed. This is a Ziploc brand bag, not the off-brand store brand. Sealed in the bag, hermetically sealed. Do me a favor, if you would just cut right down the middle. Don't go all the way through, kind of go around if you would. Go a little deeper than that, you can go a little deeper than that. All the way down. To the middle, to the middle. And uh, once you get back to your starting point, um, don't take it apart yet. Right there. Let's recap. Ladies and gentlemen, sealed in the box. It was on the stage in full view this entire morning. Sealed inside the paper bag that was super glued shut. Sealed inside the Ziploc bag with the double seal, yellow and blue make green, name brand, heavy duty. Sealed inside the orange that was sealed by God. <laughs> Is what appears to be. Go ahead and pull that apart. A soaking wet $100 bill. Is that the one? Your signature, your serial number. Give him a round of applause. We're tight on time, and we might actually just go one or two minutes over. I'm going to cost you to do this right now, but I want to get to the finale. See, the thing is about constraints. Experience is what you get when you don't get what you want. So we've got to objectively identify the right compromises. And, and we have to iterate, we have to realize that we're not going to get from zero to 100 in one day, in one iteration. It's going to get a little bit better, a little bit better, and a little bit better. That's the power of what drives us, 
and what is going to get us to achieve great things in our lifetime. Iteration. I'm going to close today by iterating my impossible prediction. I'm going to do something unprecedented. I'm going to predict the unpredictable. And I'm going to do this here. I'm going to seed our entropy pool. I'm going to throw this out. Let's, th let's throw it uh, one more time. Uh, it's right under your seat. Right down, straight down. Perfect. You know what? Why don't you come on up and uh, throw it to somebody else? We need three people. Yep, that pretty much caught you and you. Why don't you both come up? Give them all three a round of applause, everybody. Come on up. Come, all three. The thing I've learned is that to do the impossible, not only do the compromises have to be right, but the things you won't compromise have to be right as well. Come on up, front, front and center. The things you won't compromise on, those have to be right as well. I don't want to pick a number between 1 and 100. I want to pick a word out of any word in the English language. Come on, come on. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Give them a, more, a, little, a little more encouragement. I want you to pick any word out of the English language. And I say English language as a, as a requirement, as a, as, a, as a restriction, because uh, I don't no Hindi or Punjabi or any various Indian languages or dialects, and you would have me at a severe disadvantage. And yes, it would be impressive, but only if it worked, and I promise you it won't work. And if you just let somebody choose a word, it turns out we have biases. You know, we gravitate towards certain things. So I want to get, get free of bias, and, and we're just going to work our way, we're going to work our way down. Uh, I brought three books, and sir, I'm going to start with you on the end. I brought three books, and I chose these books very carefully because they're well-known books, well-read. They've been all made into movies, and, uh, and they've been internationally popular. I have The Da Vinci Code. Have you read it? Have you seen the movie? Okay, good. And I've got Harry Potter. Have you read it? Have you seen the movie? Okay, good, good. And uh, The Shining. Have you seen it? Have you read the book? Have you seen the movie? Okay, it doesn't matter. Three books. You're going to choose one of them, sir. Which one would you like? You're going to go with Harry Potter. Good. Now, before we go further, this is all about free will, free choices, predicting the unpredictable. So I want to do this. I want to make this interesting. I'm going to give you a chance to change your mind. We have two other books to choose from. Now, I might be saying this because I want you to change your mind. Maybe you picked the wrong book. I might be saying that because he didn't pick the wrong book and I don't want him to change his mind. I might be saying all of this just to mess with your head, but I will give you one and only one chance to change your mind. <laughs> Quickly, I'm running out of time. You're gonna stay with Harry Potter, okay, good. Now, sir, you have a job. Each of these books has about 500 pages in it. Come up with a random number, whole number, a page number, between 1 and 500. Go. Just pick a number between 1 and 500. I'm going to write this down. 236. Right? Is that right? Okay. And then, oh yeah, hand them the microphone. Thank you so much. Go ahead and hand that man the microphone. Harry Potter, page 236. And Miss, you have the most important job of all. Would you hand her the book? And open to page 236. In a moment, you're going to choose a word. Because I've asked people to think of a word, their biases would guide them to, pre, to words that we could potentially guess. But you're going to choose a word out of potentially hundreds of thousands from that book. And I chose all of these books, not only because they're really well known and really well read, but because the author's writing style uses lots and lots of long, interesting words. Don't say it out loud. It's a secret. And don't point it to them either. You might have to change your mind. Nobody knows the word. The, the authors also use lots of really interesting long words that we can choose from. But I want this to be impressive. I want you to pick a complicated Juicy word that will impress you, and more importantly, that will impress them. Now, here are the things, the criteria. Things that won't impress them. Character names, too common in the book. Chapter headings, too tantalizing on the top of the page or the top of the, the chapter. You know, any, any names, anything like that. I want you to choose a word in the prose, if, you may, if that makes sense. Have you got one? Don't say it out loud, just, but just, just, just nod. Take your time. It doesn't be the, have you got one? Okay. Now, 
right now in this moment, you can close the book, you can keep your finger in there if you want, so you can come to that page if you need to. But right now, there's a word in your mind that they didn't see, that you never wrote down, you never told anybody. This word is known only to you and to God. <laughs> now, I think I know what it is. Be honest with me for a moment. You didn't pick a shorter word, did you, or a common word, did you? You picked a challenging word, right? Good, I thought so. And you realize what's at stake here. If, if I get this right, what we are doing is completely unprecedented. Nobody in this room will ever forget this day. They will never forget GIDS 10.0. But if I get it wrong, <laughs> nobody will forget this either. So I want to make sure I'm on the right track. I made a little prediction. Would you tell us into the microphone just what the first letter of your word is? R. R? All right, you sure? All right, because I made a prediction before we started. Uh, right over here, in fact. In this binder clip. Prediction. Am I on the right track? Read that out loud, sir. I believe your word starts with the, with the letter R. Yeah. Here, let me take this. We're going to do a big reveal. We're going to go for a big reveal. We're going to go for broke. I want you to stand where nobody can see you over your shoulder. And I want you to write down your word in really big letters on that card. Don't let anybody see it yet. Especially don't let me see it. Big, big letters. Good grief. <laughs> All right. But I am one, hold that against you. Don't let anybody see it. But I am 100% confident that I know the word. Again, what I'm trying to accomplish today is unprecedented. Four separate decisions. Each book has potentially hundreds of thousands of available words. When you add up all these comp you know, pages, all the different pages, all the different words, all the different books you could have chosen, you could have changed your mind, all together, we are looking at over 262 million possible outcomes. I have one prediction. And if I just told you what it was right now, I don't think you would be impressed. You would think maybe I saw a mirror, I have a hidden camera, something like that. No. I did this last night in my hotel room. I recorded a prediction. Not just the word, the book, the page and the word. I recorded it, burned it onto a CD, and it's right there in the G of Gids. Young man, would you grab the CD, please? And I have a CD player. We're going to play this, the grand finale, ladies and gentlemen. Go ahead and place the CD in the CD player. You get it on the spindle. Close the lid. Yeah. And um, we'll turn it on, hold this, and hold the microphone to the thing, right, to the, right in front of the speaker. And when we get to the word, I want you to turn your page around. Let me see, let me peek, because I'm committed now. Right? There's no going back. Press play. <laughs> this is Michael Carducci, and this is my prediction. The gentleman will select Harry Potter, yes. turn to page 236, yes. and choose the word recommendation. Hold it high! Turn it around, hold it high! Thank you very much, everybody! Thank you very much! Thank you! We have an incredible day in store for you. This is just the beginning. Thank you for being here. Thank you for Dilip and everybody with Salt March. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. By the way, you can keep that CD. Take it out, that's for you. That's my gift to you, that's, that's for you to keep. Because I know they're gonna be wondering. Go ahead and take that out. They're gonna be asking you later. And they're gonna do waveform analysis, I promise you. Thank you so much, everybody.